The power of connection can be both a positive and a negative. For example, with my professional money managers and traders, sometimes I will be with them and share screens with them because sometimes they go on tilt. But when I'm there as a non judgmental observer, continually inviting them to the higher self, oh my gosh, it is so easy. They don't say, oh, I'm going to go crazy right now. But once you build those new, you know, we talked about neuroscience. Once you start building the new neural connections, even if they're part of somebody else who's making that invitation, eventually you can own them and have agency. The negative part of that is if you are in a culture, a family that is full of trauma or a culture that is despised as success or wealth, and you don't have any positive models, to step out of those means you're losing your connections. Welcome to Tech Intersect. I'm your host, Tanya Evans, and my life and work exist at the heart of law, business, and technology. Yeah, I've earned a few fancy titles and degrees over the years, but the bottom line is I'm a writer, speaker, teacher, and lifelong learner, and I'm really excited that you've joined me on this journey. So what is Tech Intersect? Well, it's authentic, empowering conversations with really interesting guests who demystify complex topics to prepare you for the future, because your future is now. And it exists where law, business, and tech intersect. Get ready to listen, learn, and leverage. Let's get started. In this episode of Tech Intersect, I speak with Richard Friesen, who works with professionals and business leaders who want to increase their personal effectiveness with joy and grace. His neuroscience-based Mind Muscles model gives his clients the opportunity to reach their goals with online training, simulations, interactive exercises, group support, and real-time decision processes. He's been a futures broker for Merrill Lynch, a floor trader for CME, CBOT, and the options floor of the Pacific Exchange, where he built and sold a successful options trading firm and served on the exchange's board of directors. He also founded and built a financial software company and is the inventor of 10 significant trading interface patents. And this combined with his master's degree in clinical psychology, neuro-linguistic programming, master's certification in neuroscience focus, brings a unique framework to business investing and career success, which we will certainly talk about. I invited Rich on to discuss how our beliefs from both nurture and nature shape our financial situation and how to invite a conversation with ourselves through self-reflection so that we can identify deeper drivers of financial and money behaviors that no longer serve us well and resolve conflicts and myths to unlock a sustainable path to prosperity in the future of wealth. We'll talk about all of that in more in a moment, but first, Rich, welcome. Oh, thank you. It's so good to be here. I've been listening to some of your podcasts and your mission of making the world a better place. I can just feel there's something bigger that you do, and I so appreciate that. Thank you so much. I've been looking forward to our conversation a lot because both of us know so many folks who are in finance or technology, you know, that I love it and can talk about it all day, every day and twice on Sunday. But without this critical component of self-awareness and self-reflection, there's so many people whom we both know who have a ton of money and are slowly dying, you know, or slowly or quickly dying quietly or not so quietly inside. And that was before even the impact of the pandemic. So many people are suffering, thinking that they were in this rat race to make money and to use money to make more money, but they have this missing sense of soul. So you know money, you know how to make money, you know how to move money, how to leverage it, how the monetary system works. You obviously also know technology. So given that, how would I describe it? Like, Wolf of Wall Street meets Silicon Valley, right? <laughs> really that could be its oh, own movie. The images you create are fantastic. <laughs> right? Maybe that's the next book. I don't know. Right? But you have that professional pedigree. But so how did you find your way to clinical psychology as well? Well, I, my bringing up, I was um, the son of a preacher. So there is always a sense of something bigger than ourselves. And even though as I grew up, I no longer hold the tenets of a very narrow evangelical religion, 
something still stuck with me. And it stuck with me is that there is something bigger than us and that contributing value to the world is really important. And so the obvious choice was as becoming a therapist. But that got interrupted by a friend who invited me to the floors of the Chicago Mercantile Exchange. And so Rich Friesen, philosophy major, therapist, stepped into this world. At that time, there's no more, you know, big floor trading. But can you imagine a thousand people in brightly colored jackets yelling and screaming on this floor? I stepped onto it and I went, wow, holy moon. (laughs) Exactly. (laughs) I I said, (laughs) this is a place that's overwhelming and I want to learn it. So I started working for his firm, CRT. And from there, I eventually built my own firm. But it was quite a challenge for me because part of the problem was my own identity and beliefs about myself, my relationship with money, with success and meaning, my old religious upbringing, how money was viewed there. And I look at my clients now, they have internalized our cultural divide, our political divide, our belief about wealth and success, all the anger against wealthy people. And Mm. then we look at good-hearted people who really care about the world They've internalized what their parents said about money, and they've got this mash of voices that just keep them constrained. It's a really powerful way to describe it as well, because there's so many inputs. There's so much noise, and it can be the noise, great word, cackle, right? So, and your work speaks to it as well, and your focus about getting quiet and still enough to find the lesson that the fact that it could be both and, and really, you made a really great point about challenging our notions and assumptions of wealth. Mm -hmm. Sometimes people come at it from a religious point of view, and I think mischaracterize what I consider to be this the spiritual energy of value that was created. That is separate and apart from maybe the mismanagement or misuse or abuse of it or people as a result of it. I mean, I sense that in a, a lot of your work as well. Talk to me about how your neuroscience focus gives you this unique framework to, to business investing and career success. Well, anytime we make a change, what we're doing is we're creating new neural connections. So if we have old patterns of behavior, We used to say, you know, there's this soul up here that makes free-floating decisions, and it can be blamed. So our whole justice system is based on some of this free will that we can do it. So what that also means, it's blame and shame. So if we look at our past in terms of, you know, we made the wrong decisions, we made bad decisions about our life, we have blame and shame. But what if they were just neural connections? What if Mm -hmm. we acted as if our past was totally determined, but then we acted as is our future we could totally create. So part of it is to reduce that judgment, blame, and shame of ourselves, of our past. And now, how can we move forward? What do we want? So I have the golden keys, and they're called awareness, and you brought that up. The second and most important is acceptance. Can we discover what's going on and all the voices, and you mentioned all the conflicts and then use the great word, all the noise inside of us. Can we listen to it, accept it rather than fighting it or willpower or discipline and all that? Once we accept it, let it come and go, then we can use agency. Now, what would I like in my life? Powerful, because that You know, when people come to that awareness, they realize that they have control over far more, you know, this idea. I think of it as I, you know, meditate and and I'm very self-reflective as well. How can I co-create this experience if I'm kind of going through life, not making it up, but this constant conversation in my mind, body, spirit of what is happening to me now, what has happened to me in the past and what is likely to happen but has not happened yet even though we both know all we have is literally this moment. If I'm going to feed into this narrative, why not make it positive? (laughs) Oh, no. (laughs) Right? Like, I have this choice, right? If I'm going to make up this story about the future, why not make it an awesome one? We'll get to that and kind of explore that. But it gives at least me, and perhaps you agree, this idea or sense of, I find it empowering. 
that I get to insert and inject some level of control over an experience and take me in a completely different direction or off to a new trajectory. Or or I think of the game I used to play as a child where I'm getting warmer, getting colder. Like I can actually influence that. Does that make sense? Well, I love that thought of the game of getting warmer and colder. May I use that? You got it. You got (laughs) it. No trademark rights. (laughs) One of the exercises we do is called the value board. You're familiar with the old vision boards. On, you know, they used to oh, have yes. them, especially the cork boards, and you put out the big house and the car and the and the hot um, spouse or whatever it is. Yes. But we changed that to a value board. What do you value? What value do you deliver? And then we work back from that. And once we work back from that, then we have a clear vision of the value what information do we need, what knowledge, what skills to deliver that value. Now what happens is, and this is going to surprise maybe some of your listeners, Walt Williams, he's a black economist, he's passed now. 20, 30 years ago, I was listening on the radio to an interview, and he called money certificates of appreciation. So if you do a service for me, I give you You've add value to my life. I'll give you a certificate of appreciation. So, and here's the scary part. If you honestly deliver value, the more certificates of appreciation you collect, the more value you have delivered. That reframe for some people relieves them of all the baggage and guilt and internal constraints they have. I've had that alone just break clients out. Now, we have other things that, and other issues, all the old voices and constraints from the past. One of the guided visualizations or hypnosis we do is we invite people to create their future and exemplify it as a house and approaching the house. What's stopping them? What are their concerns? Looking back, who in their past is judgmental? Who is critical of them? So that we can take all those voices and everything, put the handle on the door, and be in rapport with our values, our money, our wealth, and our success. How long does the process take as you work with clients through this? I, I imagine it's, it, it depends, but I think that you have really crystallized the essence of how to move people from where they are into where they deserve to be, is what I hear. How long does that process take, or what does that look like? Well, first of all, I appreciate what you just said, is that our goal is to move to find out what do people want that's part of their deepest identity and values, and then, okay, let's move them there. In fact, what I will tell a client is, we're already here. Now, let's see if there's some little things we need to clean up along the way. But if I can give them the image and the invite, sometimes that is so powerful in and of itself. But in the book, A Private Conversation with Money, I have 10 exercises. And these exercises are designed to touch almost every issue that almost all of my clients have had so that we're already there. Now, let's clean up the litter. So it's a very different concept than, oh, we've got to work through it. We've got to put discipline. It's going to be difficult. No, we're already there. Now, let's see, you know, what's in the road. You love listening to podcasts, but have you ever thought about starting your own podcast? Maybe you want to build a brand, grow your business, or are looking for an excuse to talk about your favorite hobby. Whatever your reason for making a podcast, Buzzsprout is the place to start. Since 2009, Buzzsprout has helped over 300,000 people launch their own podcasts. Buzzsprout walks you step-by-step through the whole process and will give you powerful tools to start, grow, and monetize your podcast. Ready to get started? Click the link in the show notes to get our free step-by-step guide to starting your podcast today. Hi, I'm Dr. Tanya M. Evans, author of Digital Money Demystified. And I want to let you know that to stay on the leading edge of any opportunity, especially investing, you have to empower yourself with the tools and resources needed to keep your knowledge and skills current. And if you're relying on last year's information or even last month's, look, you're already behind. Sure, you can try to figure this out on your own at YouTube University. The problem is it's difficult to separate fact 
from fiction with so many carnival barkers banking on your inexperience. And of course, there are the naysayers, usually from legacy finance, banking on your fear while they quietly help their high net worth clients to invest. All of it muddies the waters when all you want to know is how to get in safely, legally, and confidently so you're not left behind. That's why I wrote Digital Money Demystified, where I take the top 10 crypto myths head on and give you well-researched, well-supported facts to empower you to make good choices out there in the new digital cash economy. As a law professor who developed the first blockchain crypto and law online certificate program, a retail and corporate crypto policy and education trainer, and a thought leader appearing regularly on national media, I've done the heavy lifting so you don't have to. Look, there are plenty of books and courses on which crypto assets to invest in. Digital Money Demystified is the book you read before you dive into those. So head to digitalmoneydemystified.com to learn more and prepare for the future of money and wealth today. So talk to me more about the book. I'm so intrigued for many reasons, because one, we have a private conversation with money. If I saw the title in isolation, I would think more with, okay, this may be a business and finance book and some discussions about how to make more money. And then Mm -hmm. I see the second part of it as well that gives kind of like the 10 different steps as you described as well. And then the thing that I'm completely obsessed with is the fact that you use the vehicle of literary fiction to Mm -hmm. explore these 10 keys to financial freedom. So talk to me about why you chose that vehicle of writing, and then we'll get to a few of the keys that you highlight in the book. Sure. You see behind me, oh, this is going to be an audio, but behind me is uh, <laughs> bookshelves of, of, of books and many of them self-help books and transformation and psychology books. And what my own experience is, is that if something comes to me that touches me deeply or something I need to look at, it just skips right over it or I read it and say, oh yeah, good idea. <laughs> so what I do is take a character, Joe, He is a social justice warrior, anti-money, anti-wealth, very conflicted, and he meets the character Money. And he and Money have what some have called a Socratic dialogue. And they work through all the issues that I have uncovered in my own life and in the life of my clients. And Money gives them exercises, which are also available to the readers in an online course. And I'll give you a a link so your clients can have it for free. But the literary friction was was my experiment, and it's still an experiment, to see if by identifying with somebody who is working through these issues with you, does that help engage you in a way that you're willing to really look at some of the tougher things in your life? This is interesting because this idea of traveling with a trusted reference is a very powerful thing. It speaks to me for a number of reasons, but one, this idea that we first talked about, about the power that we have within us. What you just spoke to as well is the power of connection to let people know they're not alone. Oh my gosh. So that moves me so much. Talk to me about that and how you're experiencing what I just said. Yeah, the power of connection can be both a positive and a negative. For example, with my professional money managers and traders, sometimes I will be with them and share screens with them because sometimes they go on tilt. But when I'm there as a non judgmental observer, continually inviting them to the higher self, oh my gosh, it is so easy. They don't say, oh, I'm going to go crazy right now. Right. But once you build those new, you know, we talked about neuroscience, once you start building the new neural connections, even if they're part of somebody else who's making that invitation, eventually you can own them and have agency. The negative part of that is if you are in a culture, a family that is full of trauma or a culture that is despises success or mm. wealth, and you don't have any positive models, to step out of those means you're losing your connections. Sometimes it could mean you're all by yourself. 
To change your beliefs is not trivial if that means you're going to lose your connections. Mm -hmm. I have great connections with some very liberal, progressive friends mm -hmm. and great connections with some conservative friends and libertarian friends. Right. But if they were my only connection, and each of the group is very similar here, I'm not judging any one of them, yep. but if I express something different, all of a sudden the group tightens around their belief system because that is what binds them together. So we need to look at your environment and say, if you are going to change your belief, let's imagine a future where you are still connected, where you're still loved, you're honored and cherished. Mm -hmm. Because unless we can have that vision and look to see who are we are and what we want, the fear of losing that connection is going to keep us where we are. So very powerful. And it makes me think of, you know, I, I always say, obviously, I didn't coin this phrase, and I'm sure you've heard it, but just to be kind to everyone, because everyone is going through this huge Herculean journey, this soul's mm -hmm. journey that everyone is on, I think, here on this Earth School. And it makes me think of how many people have suffered from isolation and fear and uncertainty, particularly over these last three years in the pandemic. And trying to reconnect and find their footing. They're trying to find their footing and they're going back into the hyper-competitive financial and technology world that's moving at a meteoric pace in the midst of what feels like certain systems under great stress. We're looking at the failure of banks and one day you go to sleep and the next day you don't know if you're going to be able to make payroll and FDIC mm -hmm. is only insuring people uh, under 250000 and you happen to be one of those awesome small or middle-sized businesses that run the country. People are waking up and experience radical fear that was meant to be acute and not drag on and on and on. How does someone who hears you intellectually and believes intellectually in what you are saying, but needs that next right step to move in that money positive life that you speak about in the book. Yeah, so you're touching on something that's really important. If I look at, from the sheer money point of view, traders, traders that come to me say, I have a system that works, it makes money. I go, uh-oh, all systems fail. The world outside, like you say, is moving and moving so fast. So I have a confidence circle. And the, the confidence circle starts with, I'm making money right now, or I have a system that makes money. And when that fails, I look to, do I have the inner confidence to handle a world in flux? Imagine two people. One of them says, oh my God, my world's falling apart. My job no longer here. Oh my God, what am I going to do? I've ha I've just, I've, I have this one thing that I do. And oh my God, I can't do it anymore. On the other hand, somebody else says, wow, is this interesting? What I have done hasn't been working. Fascinating. Huh. Let me take a look at the bigger picture. What are my skills, my aptitudes? How am I going to be really creative here? Now, if you look at those two people and you are going to invest in one or the other, I think most of us, it would be pretty clear. That gives us, and it brings us back to this idea of recentering yourself on the next right step and what is possible and the fact that we have far more control over, well, the only thing we really have control over is ourselves. And I guess that's our conscious self because thank God we, I don't have control over my heart that's beating or the fact that I'm breathing, right? This idea at a conscious level of engaging in a world that protects me and my conscious self because the subconscious seems to be doing its own thing. But also my conscious reality and my reaction or response to it impacts me physically anyway, as a matter of health. When I think of neurons and, mm -hmm. and, and the signals that are being sent throughout my body, is that, am I kind of getting that right? Yeah. So what you're bringing up is another really important concept. Where does meaning come from? So some people will say there's an event and it's impactful of the meaning. And uh, risking getting a little political here, if we look at the woke culture, mm -hmm. it says whatever event there, it has the meaning and that is my reaction. Another way of looking at say, okay, there's an event out there. Well, that's interesting. How do I want to experience it? We know that's possible because everyone experiences an event differently. So the event doesn't come packaged with a meaning. But if we think it does, then that limits our agency and our ability. So what you just talked about is 
Can we develop the ability to say, here's a whole bunch of events. How do I want to experience them? You say, we do have control over ourselves. That's the one thing. But the magic is, once we have control over ourselves, and we are the agent of our own experience, the world changes around us. Because we're almost like magic versus all the people that are just reacting and panicking. And they're like NPCs in a cute computer game. No, I think that people are just so distracted. And so few people have the privilege of being still. And that privilege actually doesn't have as much to do with money as one might think. There are other cultures who we would consider to be (laughs) destitute that actually operate with a sense of connection, with a presence of not getting too far behind them or too far ahead, that actually isn't driven by money. I think sometimes the shiny object of acquiring is something that keeps people distracted and certainly technology. I love technology. You do as well. I appreciate the resource and tool of money because to me, it is freedom. That's a privilege. Mm -hmm. But even if I didn't have it or others who don't, it's easy for me to say, kind of looking at a different way, what it means to actually be present, what it means to be contemplative, what it means to be grateful, and what it means to kind of hit the restart button. Fun fact about me, I'm also, I don't perform anymore, but a poet. I used to perform poetry back in the days of Deaf mm-hmm. Poetry Jam on HBO. I wasn't on the special, but I oh. uh, performed quite a bit. I was the first runner up in Philadelphia, all these things. And so I think of one of my pieces that says, until you take your last breath, you can always return to your place of origin and begin again. And that's why in this story, mm-hmm. I think it's so powerful to take a step back, to have this private conversation with money. My experience in this is that I, reading through this or thinking about Joe, it's actually Joe talking to himself, (laughs) right? We have this other character, but it is having the, uh, this is an aside. It's just come to me now because I think sometimes of the different communication styles of men and women. And I've often seen for some of my male friends, if they have a son, for example, their best conversations are when they're not looking at each other, but they're like looking at a certain thing, like, a game or like something else, right? Nope. But the communication is happening. Whereas with me and my mom or my friends, we're engaged here. And if they were to look away, I would think the communication was over. So maybe also Joe is having this kind of conversation with money because it is the pathway to freedom be- because of the communication style. And maybe I'm reading too much into it, but it, it just occurred to me. Yeah, the communication style. Originally, the ending of the book was he ended up, he was talking to himself. And I think that's a very acute observation. But the editor didn't like that because then we wouldn't have the character to come back for uh, another book. Uh. So she changed it. But you're right. He was talking to himself and healing himself step at a time. Beautiful. Speaking of time, I'm looking at the time. I could continue this all day and twice on Sunday, but I'm going to lovingly release you back to your world. Before I do that, please tell the listeners more about you, your work, and to remind them how they can access the resources that you've provided for them. Sure. Conversations.money. And for the free course, you can go to slash tech, T-E-C-H, conversations.money slash tech. I'm always happy to start a conversation with people. Rich at mindmuscles.com. Rich at mindmuscles.com will get me. And if there's any way that we can support you in the end of the book, Joe ends up uh, starting a school in the inner city. And he realizes that is the value that he wants to contribute. And his world has flipped around from being angry to contributing value to some of the people who is going to make the biggest difference. And that's what I encourage everyone here to wake up tomorrow and say, how can I deliver value to my family, to my community, to my boss, to my employees? How can I deliver value to those in the world around me? Then once you're doing that, you can say, I got certificates of appreciation for delivering value. And those certificates give me what you had talked about is freedom. What a, what a win, win, win. (laughs) So I encourage everybody to enjoy and I look forward to any connection or communication. 
This is wonderful. You have absolutely added extraordinary value to Tech Intersect listeners and to me, Rich Friesen. I appreciate you very much. Don't be a stranger, sir. And don't be surprised if I call you up and say, we need to have another conversation with each other about money. We do. (laughs) Thank you so much for listening to the Tech Intersect podcast. I hope you enjoyed this episode. If you love it, please tell the world. If not, go ahead and tell me. And in either case, drop a comment or ping me on social media at IPProfEvans with the hashtag TechIntersect. And finally, a quick reminder on digital safety. There are a lot of scammers out there impersonating me and others, and I need your help. Now hear this. And remember, I will never slide into your DMs to say peace and blessings or hey, and I will never reach out to solicit your time or your money on social media like ever. I'm not a trader. I am an educator and an attorney licensed in four states. Thank you very much. I'm here to inform, inspire, and empower. No cap and definitely no forex. So be careful, make good choices, and remember, I developed an entire free masterclass about the topic of digital safety in the crypto space. So check out secureyourcryptobag.com for more information. That's secureyourcryptobag.com. All right, that's all for this episode. Until next time, continue to shine.